Okay, thanks so much. Okay, so as uh, Clifford said, I'm going to talk about uh, searching for the Higgs, the Higgs particle, the Higgs boson, if you prefer, which has uh, evolved over the last 40 years or so into some sort of holy grail for particle physicists. I think this is really going to solve one of the most uh, key problems that we have. And so in this uh, talk, what I'd like to do is to, uh, first of all, describe a little bit you know, what the Higgs boson is. Uh, I'd also like to describe, try to communicate a little bit you know, why it is that it's so important to us. And then I'll go on to discuss uh, the nitty-gritty of uh, looking for it in various different collider experiments. And I'm not going to go in any great detail, but I'd like to give you some sort of flavor for uh, what is involved in uh, trying to find this uh, infamous Higgs boson. Uh, there are several uh, players in this particular game. Uh, in fact, there's an accelerator now running in the United States, which you know, maybe has an outside chance of finding the Higgs boson. But uh, probably uh, the best chance of finding it in the near future is going to come with the uh, so-called LHC accelerator that we're currently building at CERN. Uh, now, quite a number of you heard just now uh, a talk by uh, Zeblon on uh, one of the other experiments at the LHC, and he gave you a bit of a general introduction. But for the benefit of the people uh, here who are not in the uh, summer school lectures, I'll go over some of that material again, explain a little bit what the CERN LHC accelerator is and what we hope to do with it. And uh, if time permits at the end, maybe just say a little bit about what might be the perspectives beyond the LHC. First of all, though, I'd like to put uh, all this uh, in context by uh, giving you some sort of uh, flavor for uh, how it is that we explore matter and what is the picture that we've arrived at today which provides this motivation for the Higgs boson that we're all so keen about. And uh, in particular, there was a little bit of a discussion about this at the end of the, uh, of the last lecture so I thought I'd uh, just say a little bit more about this. Uh, particle physics, I would say in some sense, started off with uh, cosmic rays uh, almost a century ago. Uh, the first discoveries in particle physics, in fact, were made uh, looking at the stuff which is showering onto us uh, all the time from the upper atmosphere. Now, for the first 50 years or so of particle physics studies, uh, this was perhaps adequate. But uh, starting, starting around 50 years ago, people realized that it would be much better to do particle collisions in the laboratory using accelerators where you could produce conditions in reproducible ways and you could have specifically designed detectors at the collisions so that you could figure out directly what was going on. And so this is what uh, big particle physics uh, laboratories like CERN, where I work, do. And uh, the other half of this uh, picture, in fact, shows you a few of the uh, dead white males who uh, 50 years ago uh, founded CERN. So basically... What you do in these collisions is that you uh, convert uh, energy into mass uh, using effectively Einstein's E equals uh, mc squared. And uh, over the past 50 years, people have uh, discovered many new particles this way, and they've understood much more about the fundamental structure of matter than would have been possible just by looking at cosmic ray collisions. Now should be said that these accelerator facilities that we now have are quite large. Uh, in this picture here, uh, top left, you have a computer-generated cow uh, generating, uh, grazing in uh, one of the fields where the CERN accelerator is now located. Uh, 
this picture here shows you what you would not see from an airplane if you look down on the CERN site. You would not see these white circles here. You would see a few surface buildings. The white circles mark where the accelerators are, but the accelerators themselves are about 100 meters underground. Here you get some idea of uh, the dimensions of the large tunnel that we now have. Uh, it's uh, 27 kilometers in circumference, and if you don't believe me, down here is the uh, Geneva Airport. Okay, so you know how big a runway of an airport is. Well, the accelerator is much bigger than that. So in this, in this uh, tunnel, uh, for about a decade, ending in 2000, we had an accelerator called LEP, and we're now building a new accelerator called LHC. The LEP accelerator told us to expect the Higgs boson and suggested that it should be at a low enough mass that with the energy available to our new accelerator, the LHC, we should be able to find it. So this is basically the story that I want to tell in this talk. So what is the basis for thinking there might be a Higgs boson? Well, the basis is uh, provided by what we call the standard model of particle physics, which is not a very glamorous name for, I think, rather a spectacular intellectual achievement. What this does is provides us with a framework for calculating what happens at particle accelerators, what happens in cosmic rays, and what happened, we believe, in the early universe since the first fraction of a second of its existence. So in this standard model, you have uh, a whole bunch of uh, matter particles. You have uh, the familiar electron. You have the neutrinos, which I'm sure everybody's heard about. And inside the nuclear particles, you have quarks. You have four fundamental forces between these uh, matter particles the familiar electromagnetic force, gravitational force, and then you have also the forces that act inside the nucleus, the strong nuclear force that holds it together, and the weak nuclear force responsible for radioactivity. Now, one of the big achievements of the standard model was to show that all these different forces can be understood as the exchange of messenger particles or bosons uh, of which the prototype is a photon, which many people, I think everybody here will be familiar with, the gluons, which also carry uh, the force, in this case the strong nuclear force, the W and Z, which carry the weak interactions, and the graviton, which hasn't been seen, but we believe carries the gravitational force. So this is uh, the basic, these are the basic elements of the standard model. Let me just show you that this thing works. This is a picture of uh, data taken by one of the experiments at the uh, LEP accelerator that we had at CERN during the 1990s. And uh, the vertical axis here is the collision rate as a function of the energy. And what you see here is an enormous great big bump, a typical resonance, and this corresponds to the production of uh, literally millions of uh, Z particles by tuning the energy of the colliding particles to the right values. What you also see here is that the uh, dots representing the data agree only too well with the theoretical calculations shown by the red line here. So this is e exhibit A to convince you that the standard model really works. You can use it and you can calculate the properties of the Z particle to a fraction of a percent. And the damn thing works. Now what you can see here also is that this uh, Z boson energy is about uh, 90 GeV. That corresponds to almost 100 times the proton mass. And this is where 
the big problem comes in that the Higgs boson addresses. Some of these elementary particles listed here are massless. The photon, for example. The photon travels forever throughout the universe. It has no Compton wavelength. It's a strictly massless particle. And we believe the same to be true of the gluon and the graviton. However, certainly the W and the Z particle are very heavy. They weigh tens of GeV, almost 100 times the mass of the proton. Electrons, they also weigh something, not very much, but they weigh something. And all the quarks weigh something too. In fact, the heaviest known elementary particle is the top quark, which weighs almost 200 times the proton mass. <coughs> so here is a big problem. How come some elementary particles are massless, some particles are massive? Why and how does this come about? And this is the job of the Higgs boson to provide those masses. So let me try to look at the problem of mass in another way. Uh, Newton told us more than three centuries ago that weight is proportional to mass. W equals mg. Right? He also told us that F is equal to ma. Uh, Einstein told us that energy is equivalent to mass. The famous E equals mc squared. But these distinguished gentlemen somehow forgot when they were telling us that weight is proportional to mass and energy is equivalent to mass, they somehow forgot to tell us where the mass comes from. And indeed, if you look in the initial formulation of the standard model of particles, if you write down the Lagrangian for the standard model and you look at it for the first time, you would also say, the particles don't have masses. There's some mysterious trick involved in the standard model in giving masses to the elementary particles. And it's this mysterious trick uh, achieved by the Higgs boson which answers the questions that Newton and Einstein uh, forgot to provide the answers to. In fact, uh, I talk a lot about the, uh, the Higgs boson. Uh, this is actually, I'm sorry, not a very good reproduction uh, of uh, Mr. Higgs himself. Uh, Mr. Higgs is a real person, uh, and uh, he's alive and well. At least he was back in uh, August. I met him uh, recently in, uh, in Scotland. And uh, here he is uh, in front of a blackboard, where uh, his equations for describing the uh, Higgs boson effect are, uh, are written down. So I guess that he's uh, probably uh, hoping to uh, stay on the surface of the planet long enough to witness the discovery of the Higgs boson and uh, then get his ticket to Stockholm. Okay. Now, I'd like to try to describe a, a little bit what is the, the mechanism whereby the Higgs uh, gives masses to the elementary particles. And uh, we actually had a, a competition about this in, uh, well, yeah, we had a competition about this uh, a few years ago in England. There was a time when uh, the British government was wondering whether it still wanted to continue to do particle physics or not. And uh, the uh, minister at the time said, you know, give me an explanation of the Higgs boson that I can tell my political colleagues that they will understand. So we had a competition, and this is going to be the winning entry. Okay. So you have to imagine that... Uh, the universe is some sort of a cocktail party. And uh, this cocktail party, which you see here, everybody chattering away to each other, you can't really hear what's going on. This is supposed to represent the vacuum. 
So the vacuum in quantum field theory is not something which is empty. It's something where things are happening all the time. Uh, they're virtual things, and you often don't see them explicitly, but they're happening all the time. And the point is that the vacuum is a, a non-trivial me medium, and that it is just the lowest energy state of the system. So you know that systems like to relax to the lowest energy. That lowest energy state is a vacuum with all these people chattering away to each other. Now, consider what happens when a uh, famous person enters this room. Now, of course, if there was nobody there, the famous person would just be able to walk straight across the room, get to the bar, and have a drink. But supposing there are lots of people in the room, as in this model of the vacuum. I should, by the way, mention that uh, the original version had this as being a famous female British politician. <laughs> right, but uh, this was uh, changed by the cartoonist here. Okay, so a particle comes into the medium. And, of course, the uh, poor famous person cannot get across the room very quickly because there's lots of people clustering around wanting to talk to her or him, and uh, so the person gets delayed. Now, of course, you know in the language of relativity theory what traveling slowly means, right? You imagine a massless particle like the photon. It travels at the speed of light, the limiting velocity. If something travels less than the speed of light, then that means it must have a mass. And so that would be the analog in cocktail party language of a particle propagating through a non-trivial medium and acquiring a mass. And uh, this is a sort of pictorial way of representing the mechanism whereby particles acquire mass in the standard model through this interaction with this non-trivial vacuum medium. And this uh, mechanism was in co-invented by Higgs, the guy we already talked about, and a couple of other people called Brout and Anglais. So you might ask yourself, well, why isn't it called the higgs brout Anglaire boson? Well, we'll come to that in a second. <coughs> Now, consider an excitation of the medium, which might happen because you put some energy into it, not necessarily a specific particle, or in, in this particular case of the cocktail party, you know, somebody shouts in a rumor, like maybe they shout a rumor that the Higgs boson has been discovered. Anyway, something to excite these people. Then... You know how it is with, with rumors. The rumors then get spread around and people discuss them with each other and then gradually the, the rumor spreads across the room more and more. Have you heard that Higgs boson has been discovered? Have you heard the Higgs boson has been discovered? So this is a, a representation of this phenomenon. So in this particular case, there is no external particle coming in it's just this propagating rumor going across the room. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is an excitation of this non-trivial background, of this non-trivial medium. And this is the part of the higgs brout Anglaire mechanism that Brout and Anglaire didn't think of. They thought about giving masses to other particles, but they didn't appreciate the fact that this could only happen if you had this quantum excitation of the vacuum, a special particle which Higgs noticed, and that's why it's called the Higgs boson. <coughs> 
So, in fact, uh, the way the Higgs trick works in the language of field theory, which we use to describe particles, is that uh, space is filled with yet another field, somewhat analogous to the electric and gravitational fields that we're familiar with. Just as different particles have different charges, and so they couple to the electric field in different amounts, similarly, different particles have different couplings to this Higgs field. And if you have a, a big coupling to the Higgs field, if you're very famous, then you get slowed down a lot, and it's impossible for you to get anywhere. Your handlers have to push the thronging crowds out of the way. Never been a problem, I noticed, but anyway. And if you're not so famous, if you have a smaller coupling to this Higgs field, then you find it easier to travel. People ignore you, and you can travel at almost the speed of light. At the bottom here, I, I have a, another analogy for thinking about it. I, I talk about field. So imagine a field where you've got lots of mud, right? And imagine trying to cross this field. If you've got big, heavy boots on, then they tend to get clogged up with lots of mud, and then you can only travel very, very slowly. So you have to think of the electron then as you know, a particle with very small ballet dance of feet that can sort of run across the field very easily, and the top quark is having you know, very big military boots or something and can only get across the field very slowly. Now, a little bit more uh, mathematically or somewhat more jargon way of describing this is you know something about the polariz possible polarization states of the photon. It has two polarization states. Similarly, you know about the polarization states of massive spin one particles. They can have polarization up down or zero, like right? the m quantum number. Okay, if j is equal to one, m can be plus or minus one or zero. So there are three polarization states for the w and the z as opposed to two for the photon. Where does the zero come from? That's the job of the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is in essence absorbed by the w and the z and provides them with this third polarization state. Now, the way this uh, trick works in the context of the standard model is that this uh, Higgs field, which I said fills up the whole universe, it has some specific value in the vacuum, in the lowest energy state. And the masses are given by the appropriate coupling times the value of this Higgs field. Now, you might say, well, you know, isn't this a little bit contorted? I mean, couldn't I just put masses in just by hand, right? And people did try that, in fact, before the standard model was formulated, and they came across all sorts of inconsistencies when they tried to do more accurate calculations with the theory. And, uh, in fact, one can show that if one wants a theory which is calculable, uh, this is the jargon word, renormalizability, okay? A theory which is renormalizable, then the Higgs mechanism, the higgs bout onglair mechanism with the associated Higgs boson is the only way to do it. Now, that being said, you could have a discussion about whether this Higgs boson is a real elementary particle like the other ones which populate the standard model, or whether it's some sort of composite object. It's a boson, but it could be made out, for example, of you know, fermions stuck inside with some very strong new force. 
and we had a discussion about this uh, this morning in uh, my summer school lecture. Many very clever theorists thought that this would probably be what happens, because this is what happens in the theory of superconductivity. This is what happens in the QCD theory of the strong interactions. However, the forces which are known, the particles which are known in the standard model do not do this. They don't bind in a sufficiently strong way. And when people try to invent new forces and new particles which maybe could bind, they found that there was inconsistency with the experimental data that I showed you earlier on, in particular from the left accelerator. The alternative would be to go back and to say, well, okay, maybe this Higgs field really is an elementary field, and there really is an elementary Higgs boson. Now, as I discussed in my lecture this morning, this carries with it certain other problems, and these other problems mean that you have to introduce some sort of new physics, and that new physics may be supersymmetry. But I don't plan to discuss that in this lecture. That's what I'm talking about in the summer school lectures. And I already started it this morning. I'll be continuing uh, the next couple of mornings. What I wanted to do with this transparency was just to say that there are these different points of view about the Higgs. Maybe it's elementary, or maybe it's composite. And fundamentally, it's only going to be experiment that's going to tell us. By pure thought, you're not going to know. You're going to have to do the experiments to find out which of these pictures is correct. So what are the experiments that have been done so far? Well, the obvious thing to do is just to do a, a direct search. You put enough energy into your accelerator. You go out sufficiently high energies to produce the Higgs boson. And in the year 2000, there were some of my colleagues at CERN who thought that maybe they'd found it. And let me just give you one candidate example for a Higgs boson. So you have to imagine that the particles collide straight into and uh, out of the blackboard. So this is a, a transverse view through the point where they collide. And color-coded, you see various jets of particles coming out. Now, the interesting ones here are the blue jet and the green jet. And what you see is that not all the particles in the green jet, nor all the particles in the blue jet, seem to come directly from the interaction point. They seem to be starting a little bit further away. And that is the telltale signature of the Higgs boson. It should decay into particles which have a relatively long lifetime, and those would show up like this in the detector. So a few events of this type were seen in uh, late 2000. And uh, in fact, on one of my previous uh, visits to uh, South Africa, this is just around the time when the management at CERN was trying to decide whether to keep the accelerator running to maybe find more of these. Finally, they decided to close it. And uh, maybe it was right, because in fact, this, signature, this signal for the Higgs boson, I, I think, is, is not very convincing. Instead, what I think we can say is that those experiments with the LEP accelerator, the previous CERN accelerator, gave us a, a lower limit on the mass of the Higgs boson of about 114 GeV. So if you'd like, about I know, 120 times the proton mass. And that's shown as this uh, yellow band on this picture. Okay, the horizontal axis is the possible mass of the Higgs boson, and this is a, a measure of the probability of finding a Higgs boson. So the yellow band is excluded. This blue band here, this is the information that we get from indirect experiments. So this I discussed already this morning in the lecture. Uh, the bottom of this curve gives the most likely value for the Higgs boson, as inferred from those other measurements at LEP, 
testing the standard model. And you can see that they prefer a Higgs boson weighing about 100 GB. You combine the blue band with the yellow region, and the most likely value for the Higgs boson is, in fact, just above this limit. And probably, according to this analysis, the Higgs boson weighs less than about 200 GB. So the message that we got from this uh, previous LEP accelerator was, uh, yep, there is probably something like the Higgs boson out there. Otherwise, the data that we got from our previous LEP accelerator couldn't be understood. And probably this Higgs boson weighs less than 200 GV, and it might be as light as 115 GV. So, what is the next step? Well, the first accelerator, which is going to try to find the Higgs boson, in fact, it is working now to look for the Higgs boson, is uh, a collider that they have uh, over in the United States at uh, Fermilab just out, outside Chicago. And this plot here, which they produced, tries to explain how hard they have to work in order to make the Higgs boson and discover it there. So this is a range up to 200 GV, which we just decided was the most likely range. And the vertical axis here is how many, uh, what collision rate they need. And these curves are for excluding or discovering a Higgs boson with various levels of significance. So, for example, if you really wanted to be pretty damn sure you'd find the Higgs boson, <coughs> if you wanted to write a, a paper to FISREV letter saying the Higgs boson has been discovered, you would need a signal with uh, five standard deviations. And according to their analysis, if the Higgs boson weighed 115 GV, then they would need 15 whatever these units are, of uh, collisions in order to discover the Higgs boson with the significance of five standard deviations. Well, so far, they've got a significance, sorry, they've got a, a, a total amount of collisions somewhere down the bottom of this thing. They've got something like two or 300, well, no, in these units, 0.2 or 0.3. Now, as they gradually increase the amount of collisions, and they think that they could probably reach about four with a bit of luck by the time the CERN accelerator starts, then what they might be able to do is to tell us that LEP did not discover the Higgs boson. Because this red band here is the amount of collisions that they would need in order to be pretty sure the Higgs boson did not exist with, say, a mass of 115 GV. So it would be very interesting. Uh, maybe the heterotron collider will tell us that the Higgs boson does not exist below, let's say, 120 GV, but it's unlikely to be able to tell us for sure that the Higgs boson exists or not. So this is where the LHC accelerator comes in. So those of you who are participating in the summer school already heard a little bit about this from uh, Zeblon earlier on this afternoon, and I apologize if I repeat some of the same material you've already heard from Zeblon, but uh, maybe I'll tell it with a different accent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here you see the, a part of a 27-kilometer circle, uh, the tunnel, where we have our accelerators. And the LHC, that means the Large Hadron Collider, we're going to bang together protons, each of which has an energy of 7 TeV, that's 7,000 GeV. So the total available collision energy in the center of mass 
is going to be something like 15,000 times the mass of the proton. And the collision rate is going to be very high. Uh, if, if I go back to that previous plot for the American accelerator, uh, in the first year, we hope to get pretty much up to the top of that. And the following years, we hope to go way off the top of that uh, plot. So we certainly should produce enough collisions to be able to find the Higgs boson, maybe find supersymmetric particles, which I'm going to be discussing in my summer school lectures, find the quark-gluon plasma that Zeblon and friends are so interested in to look for matter-antimatter asymmetry and so on. Now, here you see, unfortunately, not real magnets in this tunnel. What you see are computer-generated magnets, but this gives you some idea of what they will look like. So the tunnel, as I said, it has a, it has a circumference of 27 kilometers. It's about 100 meters underground. And the diameter of the tunnel is about 3 meters. And the, di the diameter of this magnet with its casing is about 1 meter. And the particles themselves go through little tubes in the center of these magnets, which are about 5 centimeters across. And when the particles come into collision, the, the beams of particles are a few times wider than a human hair. So you have to guide these human hairs around this 27-kilometer circle and make them collide. Okay, so the, pro the uh, project is progressing. Uh, if you go to the uh, CERN website, you can uh, see how many magnets we've got today. This is not a new plot, but this at least shows you that uh, we're making lots of magnets. And uh, the latest version of this is off the top of this plot. We've now got something like 150 uh, magnets at CERN out of the 1,200 that we need. So we've passed the 10% mark in terms of uh, accumulating the magnets. And uh, here, in fact, uh, are some of the magnets. So these are the uh, same sorts of casings that you saw earlier on, uh, generated by the computer and put in the tunnel. These are not yet in the tunnel. Um, one amusing thing is here, you see these barriers here, which are put there to prevent trucks from backing into the magnets and destroying millions of uh, rand worth of kit. Uh, these crash barriers are in fact the magnets for the previous accelerator, <laughs> the LEP accelerator. So this is a picture that uh, Zeb showed you earlier on if you were attending the summer school, uh, which gives you some idea of what is going on inside the tunnel. Okay, so this is as I already said, about 100 meters underground. So the vertical scale is very exaggerated here. And about 100 meters underground, uh, you will discover four big experimental halls. And each of these is going to have a big experiment. Uh, the two biggest ones, which are going to be looking for the Higgs boson, are Atlas and CMS. Then there's a, another one looking for the quark gluon plasma. That's Alice. That's the one that... Uh, Zeblon and friends from the physics department are looking for, uh, working on. And then there's this other experiment here looking for matter antimatter asymmetries. So, this is a, a cutaway picture showing uh, one of these detectors. This is specifically the CMS detector. And uh, this part over here is sort of all stuck together the way that it should be when it's operational. And here, the uh, computer has spread out some of the parts of the detector so that you can see what's going on inside. So you have to imagine that uh, the particles collide along this axis here. And the actual 
collisions take place right in the middle here, sort of in the middle of this sort of uh, sausage. Now, around this collision point, you see that you've got these various concentric layers of detectors, a little bit like you know, layers of onion skin. So there's an innermost layer which is detecting charged particles, and then there is uh, a layer here called ECAL, which is looking for electromagnetic energy, photons, electrons. Uh, then there's a piece called HCAL, which is trying to measure the energies of strongly interacting particles that are produced. And all the way on the outside, there is uh, this bit here, which is trying to detect muons, which penetrate through all the other detectors. Now, uh, oh yeah, I forgot. Here you see a person, okay? And uh, the overall length of this thing is going to be over 20 meters, and the height of this thing is uh, 15 meters. And in fact, uh, just a few days ago, I was uh, perched somewhere around here, and you know, you, if you've got vertigo, you better watch it, because if you fall off, you're gonna do yourself an injury, because you're gonna really smash your head on the concrete floor when you call, fall down. It's a pretty damn thing, big object. Now these things are being uh, put together by uh, global collaborations. I just uh, chose uh, a couple of pictures here. Uh, this is the end of the detector. Large parts of this were made in Japan. Uh, the supports on which the detector sits uh, were made in Pakistan. This is part of the device that's going to measure the energies of the nuclear particles coming out. This is uh, made out of brass, which comes from Russian naval shells, which were melted down, largely using American money. No, no, this is brass. Wait, what? Brass. 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 Oh. No, no, we, we, don't use, we, we don't use uranium at the LHC. So as it says here, this whole thing is supposed to be uh, completed in uh, 2007, so three years from now. So why are we doing this? Well, because you're going to higher energies, always going to higher energies, that's interesting. Because higher energies, it's a more powerful microscope, you can look deeper inside the structure of matter. So this is a sort of uh, motherhood reason for wanting a bigger accelerator. Maybe not motherhood, maybe fatherhood. <laughs> Whatever. But specifically in the case of the LHC, in this region up to 1,000 GeV, there's plenty of good reasons to expect new physics. There's the origin of particle masses, the Higgs that I've been discussing. There's the stabilization of the gauge hierarchy, which I talked about in my lecture this morning. Uh, there's dark matter, which I hope to be discussing in my lecture in a couple of days' time. So there's plenty of reasons for thinking that some new physics may show up there. But as we said earlier on, the uh, centerpiece of the Higgs physics, the thing which we try to explain to politicians, is uh, the search for this gentleman's boson. Now, this plot here, actually, this is something which I cooked up to show you the, the probability distribution for the Higgs boson. But previously, what I showed you was the benefit of the expert experts, the chi-squared function. And this is deconvoluted. This is the real probability function. So you see there's a, a high probability that the Higgs boson weighs somewhere between 100 and 200 GB. And uh, over here, this shows you how hard you have to work to make the Higgs boson uh, at the LHC. So for example, if the mass was 1,000 GV, then you might hope to get 10,000 events. 
If the mass is 400 GeV, then you might get a million events. If it was 100 GeV, you might even get something approaching 10 million events. So according to this picture, there's going to be lots of Higgs bosons made at the LHC. And if this picture is right, then we're going to be talking about you know, potentially millions of Higgs bosons. So produced. Right. So th this is what a, a produced Higgs boson might look like. So this is a Higgs boson which uh, decays into uh, four muons, which happens some of the time. It was chosen to have a mass of 150 GeV. Uh, it was produced in the middle here. Along with the Higgs boson, lots of other particles were produced in the collision. All those other particles produced these strange spirals. These things here are detector elements. And then you see a few almost straight lines. That one, that one, that one, and that one. So in this computer simulation, those are the four energetic muons that were produced by the decay of the Higgs boson. So what you have to do is you have to somehow filter out all these boring particles in the middle here and pick out events where you get you know, these four energetic particles coming out. Now this is a somewhat idealized picture. This shows you what it might really look like uh, in the CMS detector. So all these little splashes of light here, these are uh, points of detection of particles. You see all these uh, charged particles flying out. Uh, the collision axis is along here. Uh, you've got lots of particles coming out with quite high energies because their tracks are almost straight. And uh, so well, where were those four muons? Right? It's not so obvious. But I'll tell you one reason why it's not obvious, because this one does not decay into four muons. This one decays into, I think, two muons and two electrons. But you can see that this is not going to be terribly easy. And uh, for any uh, signature of the Higgs boson, there's always going to be some background coming from some other type of process which uh, looks a little bit like a Higgs boson. So this uh, responds to uh, Dave Ashman's question. Here, there are various different uh, decay signatures of the Higgs boson compared with the backgrounds. So for example, here, in this particular case, you're looking for the Higgs decaying into two photons. And you see a little bump there. And that, that is our holy grail right there, this little sort of pimple here. And you can see that this little pimple is sitting on a background of several thousand events per bin. Okay. So, okay, maybe we produce millions of Higgs bosons, but only a small fraction of those decay into two photons, and they have to be compared with a rather fearsome background. And these other plots here show you other ways in which you might look for the Higgs boson and what the backgrounds look like there. So then you might uh, wonder a little bit whether, in fact, you could be sure that uh, you're going to find the Higgs boson at the LHC or not. And uh, this is uh, a couple of plots which were put together by the other Higgs searching collaboration, the Atlas collaboration. And uh, this 10 arbitrary units, this is somewhat more than what the American accelerator expects to reach now. But this is what we expect to get, let's say, in the first year of operation of the LHC. So maybe in the year 2007, we might get 10, whatever they are, units. And what you see here is how easy it is to find the Higgs boson. This is not a picture of Table Mountain, although it looks a little bit like it. This 
here, the vertical axis is the statistical significance of the signal for the Higgs boson above those backgrounds that we were seeing earlier on. And uh, what you see is that uh, if the thing is a bit above 100 GeV, then you already get a five standard deviation signal. That's supposed to be enough that you can write a paper to, phys to PhysRev letters. And then if the mass is somewhat heavier, let's say 200 to 500 GeV, then it's 10 standard deviation. Extremely significant signal, no doubt whatsoever. Uh, this shows uh, that actually this significance comes from combining various different signals. So you're going to have teams looking for Higgs decaying into photons, Higgs decaying into bottom particles, Higgs decaying into leptons, and, and so on. And uh, so this, this whole process is going to be a little bit like, uh, you know, there's a bunch of cops working on some uh, murder mystery, and they're all looking for somewhat different clues to find out whether Higgs is really guilty or not. And uh, all those different clues, like, you know, the... Uh, fingerprints or the colors of the eyes or the length of the hair and so on. These are all different little clues and you put them all together and you finally convince yourself that the Higgs is the culprit. Okay, so I talked about the fact that the LHC is going to have this order of magnitude more energy than anybody else. And as I said, the, the main order of business of the LHC is to understand the origin of mass. But there are other things that it can do too. You get, there's lectures at this uh, school given by Joanne Hewitt about new dimensions of space. The LHC will also be one of the best ways of looking to see whether there are new dimensions of space, either bosonic dimensions of just, you know, dimensions, or fancier fermionic or quantum dimensions like what you have in uh, supersymmetry. Also, in some sense, the LHC will explore a new dimension of time because it's going to take us back to an infinitesimal fraction of a microsecond after the Big Bang. And uh, back then, it's when we think many of the puzzles about the universe might have been resolved, uh, such as where the matter came from, uh, the nature of the dark matter that astrophysicists believe populates the universe, and the primordial soup, or the quark-gluon plasma, which we believe filled the universe at very early times. So perhaps just in closing, I'll just say a, a couple of words about some of these other uh, areas of LHC physics. So um, here is a picture of dark matter. Well, you can't, can't, of course, actually see the dark matter, but the astronomers are very good at producing pictures of visible matter. Uh, but what they also tell us is that most of the stuff is not in this picture. Uh, if This is just a, a picture of a, a normal galaxy, and uh, if you look at the motions of uh, objects in this galaxy around the center, you find that they are moving much faster than you would expect according to Kepler's laws. According to Kepler's laws, they should move much more slowly. But it seems that even though they move very fast, they're still kept by the gravitational field of this galaxy, which means there must be more matter in it than meets the eye. And this, for example, could be supersymmetric particles. If you had as many supersymmetric particles as regular particles in the galaxy. And since the supersymmetric particles have to weigh at least 100 times the proton, otherwise we would have seen them by now, then there could be a, a lot of dark matter sitting in that galaxy. And since with the LHC we're going to get up to thousands of times the proton uh, mass, then there's a very good chance that uh, if this dark matter really exists in that energy range, then we're going to be able to find it. Now, this is a picture which 
tries to explain another aspect of LHC physics, which is that of recreating the Big Bang. This is, again, something which we had a little discussion about at the end of, uh, of Zeb's lecture. Um, anyway, this shows you the sorts of things that one is going to be looking for in colliding heavy nuclei at the LHC. So in the center of these collisions, the temperature is going to be very high, even by the standards of the Cape Flats. Uh, and in those very high temperatures corresponding to energies of individual particles of uh, hundreds of MeV, uh, we believe that quarks and gluons get dissociated. They're no longer bound inside nuclear particles. And one signature of that is that we should not see mesons such as the J psi coming out. And this is one of the things that uh, Zeblon and Jean Clemence and their team are going to be looking for. And then there's other signatures that people look for corresponding to phenomena later on in this collision when things have cooled down a bit. But I think actually that Zeb and friends are actually looking at some of the real hot stuff as what's going on in the core of these heavy ion collisions. So th this uh, left picture over here uh, somewhat resembles one of the pictures that you, the uh, school participants would have seen earlier on. This uh, shows you on the horizontal axis the baryon density, so the, the, the nuclear particle density. So this is the density corresponding to a regular atomic nucleus. And up here we have the temperature. And uh, what a series of experiments are doing is uh, going to uh, higher and higher temperatures. And, for example, the current experiments taking place in the U.S. at the Rick Accelerator have uh, reached temperatures of the order of 170 MeV, uh, which should be enough to produce this famous primordial soup, this famous quark-gluon plasma. And they've got various hints that this is what they have found, although so far they haven't been uh, firmed up. I think with the LHC, one's going to certainly be able to create uh, energy densities corresponding to much higher temperatures. Um, this is some estimate of how high a temperature it should be possible to reach with the LHC. So here, for sure, you're going to be turning those quarks and gluons into a plasma, and uh, hopefully at the LHC, one is going to find clear signatures of it. So this is a picture of uh, what the ALICE detector looking for this quark gluon plasma will look like. So it's again a sort of onion skin structure, except that here you see there's a sort of um, stalk coming out of the onion. Not, not sure whether onions have stalks. They have, have something at each end, right? But then would you call them a stalk? Anyway, there's something coming out the end of this thing. And, and this is where you're going to look for muons. This is where you're going to look for J-psi's, which don't appear uh, because the matter in the center of these collisions was so hot that the J-psi particles all melted. So that's, that's the bit that the group from uh, UCT is working on. And... Uh, this is actually uh, happening. This is uh, a picture of the uh, magnet for the ALICE detector, which is uh, what well, existed before. It's taken over from a previous experiment, but here it's being reconditioned. And uh, this is uh, a quote-unquote uh, typical collision, which they should observe in this detector. So the collision took place right in the middle here, and you can see they produce uh, thousands of particles. And uh, the job of the UCT group is to be sure that there weren't any J-psi particles in there. So good luck. Okay. <laughs> uh, and this is why they need real fancy computers. Right? But I won't go into that story. Zeb already said something earlier on this afternoon about their fancy computers. Okay, so the, my main subject 
uh, in this talk was the Higgs boson. And uh, perhaps before closing, I'll just briefly mention that uh, there are ideas for a possible future accelerator. Nobody knows where it would be built, which instead of colliding protons, which is what we're going to be doing with the LHC, would collide electrons and positrons. A and the interest of this is that you could observe those Higgs bosons in a very clean way without worrying so much about the backgrounds. And this would enable you to measure the properties of the Higgs boson more precisely than what the LHC can do. So here is a function of what the mass of the Higgs boson might be, is how accurately you can measure the decays of the Higgs into bottom particles or uh, into Ws or into Taus and so on. So you can do very accurate measurements with an electron-positron collider, of course, d depending on how heavy the Higgs is. And uh, I at least feel that you know, a key ingredient in the planning for a linear collider should be the information that we get from the LHC. That'll tell us how much energy we need and how much luminosity we need and so on in the linear collider. So here is a sort of uh, summary. I, I, I talked earlier on about looking for the Higgs boson, a little bit like uh, a police inquiry. And I actually found this cartoon stuck up above the Xerox machine of the CERN Director General's office. So uh, wanted Higgs particle mass unknown, reward Nobel Prize. Uh, the reward, I guess, would probably be for, uh, for Peter Higgs. <laughs> Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. same uh, collisions that you use to make the Higgs boson, you can also make to look for lots of other things. You just look for different types of particles coming out of the collision. So in fact, what's going to happen is that at the same time that you know, there was some team of people looking for the Higgs boson, there's going to be another team of people looking for supersymmetric particles. And uh, I'm not really a betting person, but if I was a betting person, I'd be prepared to bet one rand first things you will discover at the LHC will be supersymmetric particles and not Higgs bosons. But I'd be happy either way. Okay. What other use can you make of that? <coughs> okay. Uh, Sometimes you can reuse accelerators. For example, the LHC accelerator is going to be in the same tunnel as the old LEP accelerator. And components of the old LEP accelerator uh, have been given either permanently or on loan to various laboratories around the world you know, for doing other experiments, uh, other experiments with. So at some level, they can be uh, recycled. Now, could you recycle the LHC? Uh, after it's been operating for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, however long it, people are going to want to do experiments with it. Well, there are actually ideas for taking out the LHC accelerator and putting in an, yet another accelerator with even higher energies, uh, which by that time would probably be technically feasible. I, I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. Uh, but I can certainly imagine that certain of the detector components could be used for other experiments. That, that's what's happened in the past. Perhaps I could just, one other comment. You may say, well, you know, what use is of all this accelerator stuff? You know, this is just, you know, you know a bunch of rich guys and you're amusing themselves and spending billions of whatever money they have on you know, this sort of scrap. Uh, do you know how many accelerators there are in the world? About 10,000 accelerators. And do you know where most of those accelerators are? They're in hospitals. Most of the accelerators around the world are in hospitals where they're used to produce 
radioactive isotopes, which are then used in diagnosis. So that, that's most of those 10,000 accelerators. Several thousand more are used uh, in industry. And then there's you know, a few hundred, maybe, which are actually used for doing research. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, even if an individual accelerator, maybe you don't recycle it for something useful, you know, the ideas that you use to make it, you can recycle. Einstein and Newton had omitted to tell us the origin of mass, but was it for them a problem? I mean, my guess is that they did not regard it as a problem. So can you tell us, when did it become the driving question in particle physics? Fairly recently, because when you and I were students, it wasn't hammered into us that this was a problem. Some particles were heavy, some were light. But it became a problem, what, 15 years ago after gauge symmetries? Well, I think that, uh, yeah, when gauge symmetries came in, then the problem really came into focus uh, for the reason which I mentioned very briefly in my talk. That if you just put masses in by hand into a gauge theory, then the whole thing blows up. In a gauge theory, you can only put masses in if you use this uh, higgs bout Onglet mechanism and if you, if you have a Higgs boson. But, but in some sense, you know, the, the problem of mass, I mean, it was there beforehand. I mean, this, this whole issue of the uh, uh, equality between gravitational and inertial mass, uh, the principle of equivalence, uh, the geometrization of, uh, of gravity, this all has to do with the nature of mass. Um, but I think that it was, uh, as you say correctly, it was the advent of gauge theories which really put it on the particle physicist's agenda and made us think about it and try to understand where it came from. Uh, I just wanted to check something. Um, the Higgs boson operates on the cocktail body uh, without actually partaking of it. Well, the Higgs boson is somehow a sort of excitation of the cocktail party. So it's, it's a rumor, but it never actually enters in the same way that Maggie Thatcher does. <laughs> well, um, yeah, no, I think that's pretty pretty accurate. You, you have this this field, and if you're a purely classical physicist, you could say, okay, well, I got a field out there, and you know that's that's it, right? But you know, if you're a quantum physicist, that in general, if you have a field, then you also have excitations of that field, and the photon is the classic example. Sorry, I shouldn't have used that word. <laughs> It's a standard example, right? Because it's, it's a quantum excitation of the electromagnetic field. And so Higgs, as I said, was the guy who realized that there would have to be this quantum excitation of the Higgs field, and that would show up as a new particle. Um, so my question is, how does this lead us on to finding the graviton? Ah. The graviton, according to our conventional theories, would be extremely weakly coupled. Uh, so weak that uh, conventional sorts of experiments that anybody's been able to come up with, I don't think you would ever be able to find a graviton. That being said, there are some you know, crazy ideas out there which would mean that you could detect gravitons also at the LHC. Uh, and that is these theories with large extra dimensions. And uh, Joanne Hewitt in her lectures will be talking about these. In these models, gravity... Uh, can become surprisingly strong at surprisingly low energies and that means that you can produce events in which gravitons stream out of your detector. Now, I'd be prepared to bet two rand that this doesn't happen, okay? But, you know, it could happen. Secondly, isn't it true that uh, Higgs's picture was generated by the same computer that generated the car? <laughs> <laughs> There are very basic 
theoretical arguments for saying that it surely has to show up below a 1 TV. So otherwise, the probabilities that you calculate for collision rates go crazy. So when I said earlier on that very likely it weighs less than about 200 GV, uh, that was based on obviously a refinement of those calculations. And it's reflecting the fact that when we calculate observable experimental measurements at the, at the LEP accelerator and other accelerators, we get sensible answers which are not infinite. Okay, they're very precise finite numbers. And those precise finite numbers tell us how much the Higgs has to weigh. And that, then the answer is less than 200 GV. But, but, but even if we, we got all that all wrong, still there would be very, very basic reasons for thinking we have to weigh less than 1,000 GV. If, if there's no question, would you just allow me to make a couple of comments? Okay. Yeah. That it's, I, I've talked a lot about CERN, and uh, you know, CERN stands for Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire. So it's a, it's a European organization, right? And uh, most of the money for all these accelerators that we build are paid for by these uh, 20 European countries that uh, uh, actually pay for the uh, organization. But I just wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, we're open to uh, collaboration with scientists from any, anywhere in the world that want to use our facilities. Just enough for somebody to come to us with uh, you know, a, a good idea or some technical expertise that you know, fits well with our experimental program. And uh, we're ha happy to work with those people and uh, have them participate in our experimental program. And uh, you see here, for example, that we have countries from uh, Latin America, we have countries from Africa, we have Morocco and uh, South Africa itself. Uh, we're just developing now a collaboration with, uh, with Egypt. Uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, Pakistan has been contributing important parts to uh, the CMS detector. Uh, China is also involved. Uh, Iran uh, joined one of our uh, LHC collaborations uh, a few years ago. So uh, now, I wanted to emphasize the fact, since there are many people here who come from other African countries besides South Africa, that we would also be happy to collaborate with you and your countries uh, if we can find uh, a good scientific uh, basis for doing so. Is that number of institutes uh, members in your collaboration? These numbers are the numbers of scientists. Okay, so the, the total number of uh, scientists who uh, use the CERN facilities to do experiments is about 6,000, okay, somewhat over 4,000 from Europe and about 1,700 from other parts of the world. And uh, the big uh, armies of these external uh, non-European collaborators come from Russia and from the United States. But there's still another several hundred that come from other countries around, uh, around the world, uh, including some from South Africa. It says one here. Well, I don't know why it's only one, because... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Th th there's a big problem with this, because, in fact, I was having an email exchange today with one of my colleagues at, uh, at CERN who was complaining that we don't have more Latin American countries here. We certainly have collaborators from Argentina. Just like last week, we had a group from uh, Chile visiting. So uh, I think this... In fact, this is a somewhat old map. This is a somewhat old version. Anyway, uh, if anybody would like to talk to me about this, I'd be happy to discuss it further offline. <laughs>